Singapore is a universal collage of cultures where people of different ethnicities and beliefs coexist. Each community offers a different perspective on life in terms of culture, food and language. Art is all around Singapore in different forms, a way of creative expression, storytelling and cultural appreciation. But how do Singaporeans keep their traditional art forms alive while embracing the new? Get ready as we embark upon this 13-part journey showcasing the different art forms in Singapore through the history, culture, tradition and evolution of the art scene of Singapore. Singapore's culinary scene is synonymous with our hawk affairs. But it's our diverse food offering at every price point that earned us our global reputation as a food haven. So how did we go from this to this? A lot of the dishes that are popular in Singapore today were brought by the early migrants. They were working as labourers. Um, they came to Singapore. They didn't have time to cook for themselves. They needed to eat out. And that's how the hawkers started. A lot of them work together and thus eat together. I think the flavours that we like today reflect that. So if you look at the early Chinese food of Singapore, the flavours are a little bit more piquant, having been influenced by, say, the Indians or the Malays. Chinese in Singapore eat, you know, whatever they eat with sambal on the side, which is not something Chinese in China do. The intermingling of cultures has yielded, you know, quite unique dishes in Singapore. Uh, for instance, fish head curry. Uh, that's not something you find anywhere else. This local favourite is created by Marion Jacob Gomez, an Indian immigrant from Trivandrum, who opened a small eatery, Gomez Curry, in the 1940s. You know, those days, all the Indian market, they used to throw away the fish head. While fish head wasn't a typical Indian delicacy, Gomez picked up on its popularity among the Chinese. He spiced up his fish curry recipe by including fish head to appeal to his Chinese customers. Chinese, they like seafood a lot. For like Indian restaurants, you need to have uh, these items like fish head curry, uh, chili crab and all that become very famous among the locals. Today, this creation from the fusion of Indian and Chinese cultures remains unique to Singapore. Mm -hmm. 
You can't find uh, fish head curry in any part of the world like where you can find in Singapore. Not even in India or South India. Uh, they don't have fish head curry there. While some of our favorite hawk affairs were created from the intermingling of cultures, others came about from the lack of ingredients. As migrants who settled down here wanted a taste of home. Everybody wanted to cook the food that they were familiar with but they couldn't find all the ingredients. So they started mixing and matching. So you find very interesting things like kaya. I think how it came about was, you know, the British would have wanted their custard to be made, but there's just no cream and milk. Because dairy is hard to find in Singapore, right? So what do we use? We use coconut milk. You know, I think that's, that's how the adaptation came about. So you have all these different flavours coming in together and, and creating a very unique identity for our cuisine. There are different stories on how kaya came about. Some believe it was adapted from fruit-based jams from the British, with the kaya toast set inspired by traditional British breakfast. Others believe it was created through experimentation with serikaya, a broad range of egg-based coconut cream confections in Malay cuisine. While the origin stories differ, the spirit of experimentation and adaptability remains a core ingredient of our food story. And it's what elevates our culinary scene amidst changing tastes and preferences. You don't want to eat the same thing for a dozen years, right? So you want to change it up a bit. Um, but they are flavours, again, that we grew up with and we enjoy. And so when we interpret them into different creative dishes, but at the same time remaining true to the flavours and textures of the original dish, um, I think there's a lot of room to play with them and for people to enjoy them as well. For example, chicken rice. In the beginning, it was a very, very simple dish, right? So it's just maybe steamed chicken, boiled chicken and some flavoured rice. These days, while it's still a seemingly simple dish, it is not an easy dish to create because just poaching the chicken is a technique that not everybody uh, does well. And over the years, chicken rice went from just poached chicken to maybe roast chicken and uh, soy sauce chicken. So there are you know, more variations of chicken rice than there were in the past. Chicken rice is just one of the many examples. The variations can also be found in dishes from abroad, where flavours are tweaked to better suit the local taste, like rendang. There is a lot of different kinds of rendang. Singaporeans like a lot of gravy. So for our version of the rendang, it is more gravy and less spicy, suitable for the Singaporean uh, taste. In addition to the variety of choices available, Singapore's hawkers have also made a name for themselves in making the best food from the limited quality ingredients available. If you think of hawker food, it's always food that might not necessarily be the best cuts. It's always going to be cheap cuts. But when you use cheap cuts and cheaper ingredients, then it takes real skill to make it taste better. In the past, we just limited what we have here. So traditionally, say for example, a beef rendang, the reason a rendang is made was because there was no refrigeration. So it was cooked till it's really dry, so the spices would then preserve the meat. 
today, we don't have to use the cheap cards anymore. Today, we could do rendang with Wagyu from Japan, for example. It adds a new dimension to it. So today, we use ingredients that was not available to us. And I think that's a very exciting um, development. These modern twists to traditional recipes not only satiate locals' desire for more food options, it also propelled Singapore's hawker scene to a global stage. I realised Singapore food had arrived when it was on The Simpsons show. I think Bert was having a dream and it was Anthony Bourdain and very all the high-class chefs at Gordon Ramsay were in the hawker centre. I don't care whether they get the pronunciation wrong and the dishes wrong, but the whole fact that they were going on in the hawker centre and saying, the food is wonderful, I said, this has arrived. In a world that's so divisive and it's so hateful, and it's so wonderful that people realise that people can eat together of different religions, different races, at a table. You know, you can have Malay food from the halal and Chinese food and to be enjoying together. And I think that that whole uh, experience resonates with people. Beyond the hawk affairs, Singapore is carving a name for itself in the fine dining scene. With more than 50 Michelin-starred restaurants, there's a flavour to suit every palate. Fine dining for me is the act of being able to provide people the best possible produce, the best possible service, the best possible environment, but to do that in a way that is genuine and relevant for the time that we live in. It is a ritual actually. When I was in Paris, fine dining means you must have a certain style. Access was the most important thing, and still to this day, we see a lot of fine dining restaurants that are really all about the splurging of luxurious ingredients and really coaxing the sense of exclusivity, right? In the early years of fine dining in Singapore, the scene was limited to a handful of hotels with good restaurants primarily serving dignitaries and affluent customers. The first maybe international wave that came to Singapore was German tables. Then came the French and Italian became very, very popular. Then in the last 10, 15 years, chefs have let their imaginations run riot. Over the years, Singapore's fine dining scene ballooned as the middle class came to appreciate the nuances of fine dining, which prompted chefs to rethink their approaches. As things change, fine dining is also going to be about inclusivity and also seeing the value, the luxury in a carrot, in a cabbage, in a process. And so not necessarily just in fancy ingredients served with uh, pomp and circumstance, what we've seen now is dining that is reinventing itself and consistently looking for a way to connect with people of all sorts of strata. So much of good food, like Italians like to put it, is, is all about the cucina povera, right? The food of working class people. And uh, I think what started to happen as of late is that the, the entire fine dining segment started to incorporate these incredibly delicious foods, street food concepts, ideas that are perhaps uh, more for the masses and people who are there toiling the soil all the time, who need a affordable pasta, for example, and converting that into an incredibly luxurious experience. Luxurious, not just in how the ingredients are handled, but also how a dish is presented and plated. It's impossible to deny the impact that the way a dish is plated has on your ability to perceive taste and 
your enjoyment of things. It's absolutely crucial that plates of food look inviting. Uh, I think it was Princeton or Yale that published a paper about how people like to eat food that looks like it's running away. And so if you plate a dish that looks like it's charging at you, so the head of the lobster is looking at you, that you don't like it as much as if the lobster head was looking away from you because your primal senses are engaged with chasing that animal. And so decisions that you take on the plate make a huge impact on the perception that people have of taste and quality. Chefs design their own plating framework for this artistic endeavor. With constant research and finessing to find the right combination of tastes, textures and colors on a plate that would appeal most to the diner. There's a difference there between conceptual artworks uh, and something that just looks pleasing to the eye uh, with, without necessarily a thought given to the context, the concept. I would venture a guess it's very hard to consider food as art uh, because we can't do specific things that art forms can, you know? You can't provoke people with weird feelings and emotions because ultimately when you go to dine, you want to be pleased only, right? As an art form, it, we're still really scratching the surface of what our capabilities are. And I think the more attached we become to the aesthetics of things, which is currently where we are in this generation of Instagram and art on the plate conversation, uh, the, the more harm we do to the notion of food as art, you know, because it, it's just pretty and that's craft. If pretty plated food isn't art, what does it mean to be creative in this scene? I think we often confuse the use of the word creative because there's this notion of the person making the food being the innovator guy who's just going out there and braving the world. But for me, creativity is more an act of discovery of something. It's less an act of creation. I think the creativity that is overindulgent isn't creativity at all. It's an act of just hitting the same key time and time again. Somebody who just knows these tropes work and they're gonna layer them up and make it time and time again in this particular fashion. But there's so many innovative chefs out there who are literally trying to question the system they're operating under and just creating on top of that. And that's real creativity, the real discovery of a new way of doing things, a new way of fusing things. And I, I see a lot more of that these days. There's a small but growing group of young chefs who are trained in Western cooking, but they are really taking pride in taking what they've learned from Western cooking school and applying that technique to Southeast Asian cuisine. We are really embracing our roots and taking it to a new level. Experimentation by these groups of chefs spiced up the fine dining scene here in classic hawker style. I was studying in the UK, and that's how I started cooking, because the food was terrible in the hostels. I had no choice out of necessity to survive. I started cooking for myself. Um, I missed home, and I missed food from home. But I couldn't find all the ingredients that I wanted. So what I did was, I mix and match things. Um, they never looked like food from Singapore, but when I ate it, it always reminded me of home. And that became the style of cuisine that I started cooking. 
Willin's mix and match style of cooking draws parallel to the early days of Singapore's food story, where hawkers created dishes with the limited ingredients they could find in order to recreate flavors from home for the early immigrants. And that led him to create a new cuisine genre that's uniquely Singapore. When I first opened my restaurant, Wild Rocket, everyone was asking, what cuisine is this? And the press wanted to put a label on it. They called it fusion food, which wasn't wrong, but in the 80s, fusion food was done so badly in the West, it became confusion. And I didn't want to have anything to do with that, so I created a new term for it. I said, well, this is Singaporean food, but it's modern. We called it modern Singaporean cuisine. And I said, let's call it Mod Sin for short. And that's how the term Mod Sin started. I, I never thought of um, modern Singaporean cuisine as a, you know, elevating traditional food. Because to me, traditional food is up there already. It's so good. It doesn't need elevation. You know, what I did merely was to celebrate it. And this is our oyster omelette pasta. I started by taking traditional food apart and reassembling it on a different platform. But to me, what's important is if you are paying homage to, to local food, then I think the spirit of the dish has to remain. Today, Motsing cuisine can be found across different price points, not just in fine dining, but also in the hawker scene. Like this bowl of Singapore-style ramen that's been awarded the Michelin Bib Gourmand for seven consecutive years. This bowl of noodles is a concoction of flavors and ingredients inspired by Japanese ramen and Hong Kong wonton noodles with a unique Singapore twist. First, the noodles are very important. Our noodles are very thin, so it cooks very fast. What we do is we blanch it in very hot boiling water and then we immediately refresh in ice water to stop the cooking process and then we heat it up again. The important thing is the seasoning. So what we do is two very umami ingredients, dry kelp and a dry shrimp. So dried seafood are very high in natural umami. So these two are synergized to give it profound taste. So after that we have our sous vide char siu, which we cook for 36 hours and we dip in our special marination char siu sauce. We plate it at the side with our two beautiful huge wonton and then uh, we have our crispy nor yang which is our fried freshly a la minute. We have some uh, finely sliced scallions, spring onion and then uh, a beautiful uh, red colour dried pepper yeah. and then we have this uh, lovely marinated onsen egg that when you cut it, the yolk will flow out. And we serve our soup on the side. Innovation in Singapore's culinary scene continues to simmer, fueled by the next generation of hawkers entering the industry. In 2020, Singapore's hawker culture was inscribed on the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage List, which means more effort will be taken to safeguard and preserve the local hawker scene. I think the hawker trade is in a very exciting phase of its evolution. Uh, one, because social media. Two, because we are on global stage you know, with the whole UNESCO listing. So now we have the option of serving local Singaporeans, but we also have the option of serving an international uh, clientele. What that means, we are able to firstly take what we call heritage tradition and showcase that to the world. But at the same time, we are also able to be more inventive, be more creative with our product offerings and also bring that to the next chapter. So it becomes history. Making UNESCO uh, celebrate the whole hawker culture in Singapore really helped bring up some of the younger uh, hawker printers. Now we have the younger ones coming out and say, hey, 
maybe you have something to offer. Some young hawkers start their business from scratch, while others add their own twists to family recipes that have been passed down for generations. For my siblings and I, being able to serve local, traditional, salt brewed Nanyang kopi and teh is part of our culture. We actually took over the hawker store from our father about seven or eight years ago. Before that, he was working with his father uh, in a neighbourhood kopitiam. From there, we uh, managed to springboard to other flavours that actually go very well with traditional coffee, like black sesame kopi or hazelnut teh. As young hawkers jump on the UNESCO hype to start their own hawker businesses, sustaining the business is a challenge that many don't account for. A lot of young hawkers, they may have tried to start learning how to make traditional wonton mee. But maybe two, three years down the road, they haven't had very good reception, that then they give up. But that's because people nowadays, we are a little bit more critical. So going back to maybe 50 years ago, when the first wonton mee store came about, pretty sure the old uncle and auntie also had problems perfecting that plate of wonton mee. But you give them 50 years, they become a heritage brand. When we first took over, half of my dad's regulars left because they think it just didn't taste the same with a young person behind the coffee stand. But we've been here 20 years already, half of it which was run by my brother, my sister and I. But because people gave us a chance. While brewing a good cup of coffee takes patience, perfecting it requires a balance of resilience, creativity and adaptability to consumers' ever-changing tastes and preferences. As the older generation are hanging up their work, you see a lot more young hawkers coming out to want to bring their home recipe to the locals and people who are coming to Singapore. So what they do is uh, they add in more premium ingredients like scallops, king prawn, abalone and all that to differentiate themselves and to elevate the dish. I think the advantage that us young hawkers have is of education, you know, and access to global news, access to global trends and global food preferences or uh, tastes. So having that experience, which maybe our my, my dad didn't have, kind of helps us to adapt more quickly in terms of, I'd say, adjusting the food or adjusting the menu to a more wide audience. Social media has changed the culinary scene around the world. Food now has to look as good, if not better, than it tastes. My decision to go to a new place based on the social media would be at least 60 to 70 percent. I see an influencer who actually went to the hawker centre before and actually recommend a dish that's really popular, then I will be more inclined to go. My friends and I, we always look at um, TikToks because they do a lot of reviews. We have been disappointed before, got a shock before also. We eat with our eyes first. Having the visual appeal is, is a definite plus, especially in this Instagram age. So say you're serving a bowl of laksa, you could just serve the laksa with a bit of chopped up laksa leaves and then, you know, there you go. But if you want it to look 
especially appealing. You know, these days people might parboil an egg, so you don't just have a hard-boiled egg, you have an egg with a runny yolk. Um, you have, you know, deep-fried laksa leaves that, that sort of gleam on top of the bowl. So those, those are uh, extra touches that you can make to make the dish more visually appealing. Our first big break was from social media itself. We had a pretty prominent food blogger come one fine day out of the blue. And after he featured us on his blog, last time blogs were still popular. So that was like 2015. So ever since then, I think it kind of put us in the media spotlight. So from there, we became sort of like an Instagram favourite, um, mainly because of how our drinks and our toasts look good on camera. It has affected us, but always in a good way. What happens is the consumers will all... There might be a dish that suddenly becomes a star social media and it goes viral, right? And everyone's talking about this particular dish. And they come to the restaurant to eat that particular dish. But the good thing is because of that dish, they are at the restaurant. And then they, go, they can't possibly just order this. They're going to order a few other things. <laughs> Uh, I come from a generation where kitchens were incredibly dark and dingy places, where people worked behind, and these processes and the humans behind them never saw daylight, and, and nobody really knew what happened there. And so social media kind of validated some, some of that work. It brought it to the forefront. It, it raised the status of the chef, the cook, the front of the house staff member, changed the way that people interact with restaurants. It made them more aware of the real costs. And I think all of those things are real uh, results of social media interaction and the ability that any individual has to scrutinize the, the work that happens in a restaurant. The bad thing, of course, is there are some hawkers who have no access to social media. And just because somebody else is more savvy with it, they get more attention and people think that they are better. Whereas somebody else who might do a really good dish, for example, just continues to hide in the shadow because they don't have social media. It's also created a special negative spot, which is the repetitive aesthetic, the fact that everybody's food starts to look and feel very similar to one another. And so in some regards, social media has also made us a little more pasteurized and, and uh, homogenous in a sense. And, to stand out, people have had to do perhaps more superficial changes and less intense and intended changes. Restaurants and hawkers aren't the only ones tapping into these platforms. It also spells new opportunities for home chefs and culinary enthusiasts to share their cuisine experimentations. People are sharing, you know, um, dinners they've had in homes, which is nice because home cooking is a bit different. It's lovely that people are sharing their sort of home recipes or what they create. Private dining gives um, Singapore's very avid foodies yet another facet of, of food that perhaps we wouldn't be able to try if not for these experiences, right? So you're being invited into someone's home to eat the, the food that they would cook for their own friends and family. So I think that gives people something to enjoy and to think about. It's not only these home chefs that benefited. The food styling and photography industry boom too. The whole point of food styling is to make a dish or a product look good um, and appealing. Food styling usually starts where I would talk to my client. It could be the chef, a marketing person as well. Uh, we get down to the very base concepts that they have in mind. From there, there will be a conceptualization stage where we, the things like the stories that they want to tell, uh, the food they serve, the type of cuisine, and, and so on. I personally see a lot of value in terms of story and narrative. That is when the idea kind of comes to life for all of us. 
there are technical rules and there are also just uh, things where you kind of have to trust your intuition and your visual understanding of um, how food looks good or what makes food look good. One example of how you apply that technically would be understanding like the odd number rule, which is where you style your food with odd numbers, for example, three or five. I was styling fishball noodles. Maybe the number of fish balls I would use is three or five. That kind of thing. And I think other factors like height or how small or how wide or large a dish should be, uh, I think all those factors also play into how people would perceive the dish to look as well. The difference between myself and a chef who serves food at a restaurant would be that my styling considerations ultimately lie within what appears in the frame. So there will be situations where the food maybe is not perfectly cooked uh, in so as to bring out the best colour or vibrancy to um, the dish, as well as using strips of um, kitchen towels to elevate a part of the dish to make a dish appear taller or more upright. Consuming the, the, the dish with your eyes first would then draw you to want to consume it properly in said restaurant or cafe. More businesses, uh, especially hawker businesses these days, are starting to take up social media marketing for their store and they want to draw people to come and try their food. The challenge then is uh, making the dish stand out because there can be like hundreds of chicken rice stores. So how does yours stand out? And I think photography is a great way to elevate that. I think with hawker food, can be a lot of play or narrative going into uh, the details of heritage. You can go into those storylines as well. And I think, yeah, a lot of value can be brought. Experimentation has been the main ingredient in Singapore's food story. And we continue to spice up our food scene with new twists and flavours, while retaining the heart and soul of our traditional recipes. At restaurants, hawker centres, and even from our homes. Singapore is a true foodie haven just from the sheer diversity of food that, that's available here. So you could eat a, the cheapest Michelin star you know, dish in the world, or you could eat for a lot of money, um, and everything in between. I've never seen a population more obsessed with what they eat for lunch and dinner. The first conversations I've ever had in this country with my local friends were always about taking my breakfast, taking my lunch, and just the sheer use of the word taken, as if this was like that moment of conquering something, you know? Like, that's the motivational force behind a lot of our actions. The arguments behind who has the best Hokkien me, or do you like it wet or dry, or... All of those tests are incredibly exciting for a chef. We want people to be passionate about food. We get all the food around the world at one place, and it's very easy for us. I think it's precisely because of the different races and cultures that came together. We know good Indian food, we know good Malay food, we know good Chinese food. Um, we have access to some of the best Italian restaurants and French restaurants, Korean and Japanese. Because of that, the average Singapore palate is very developed and, you know, we are able to appreciate a wider range of food and ingredients. When I used to have a food magazine, I want ideas, I just ask the taxi driver. He can tell me how to steam the fish perfectly in most other countries. This sort of conversation is only among the upper middle class, middle class and the higher. You don't get this conversation among everybody. And I think that's what makes Singapore different. The diversity in opinions is reflected in the quality of food options available across various price points. Michelin recognised dishes aren't limited to upscale restaurants they can also be found in unassuming hawker stalls. When we started this out, we did not go for any Michelin or any awards. All this come naturally because we are focused on 
providing the best food, best service and the best value for the quality. But with the Michelin Big Gourmet, we can say that our local hawker food are actually on par with the world's best fine dining restaurants. My father always used to tell me, uh, don't advertise much. You give good quality food, word of mouth, it will make customers to come back. Focus on that. Singaporean cuisine is very unique in the sense that it's like a rojak. But I think this rojak cuisine is in on par with the best cuisine in the world, like French cuisine, Italian cuisine. Singaporeans love food. We want to go to every new restaurant. We want to taste every new variation of burger that, that you know, McDonald's puts out or something. But at the end of the day, um, what keeps food exciting for us is flavours that we enjoy and flavours that we recognise. So as long as we stay true to the original flavours of things that people make in whatever modern iteration it is, that will continue to excite us. Singapore's food story began with dishes created by street hawkers who attempted to provide early immigrants with a taste of home. These traditional recipes have since been passed down for generations to form a UNESCO-recognized hawker culture. Holding its ground, even as new entrants and Michelin-starred restaurants are constantly introduced to spruce up the dining scene. From no-frills hawker fairs to upscale mods in cuisine and fancy restaurants, Singapore's melting pot of global cuisines reflects a cultural fabric that's like no other.